Today's scripture reading is taken from uh, Matthew 10, 1 through 8. Please follow along with me. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles first, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alcaeus, Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And if you would, once more, join me in prayer. Father, we do just thank you for the reading and the blessing of your word in our lives. We pray um, that you would continue to be present in your church, not just here, but abroad. And I pray specifically for our sisters and brothers at River Crossing Ministries here in Rodoso, that they would know more of who you are, that your word would be faithfully proclaimed, and they would help be your body and your kingdom here in Rodoso. And for those of us that are here this morning, we just ask that you would come and open our ears and soften our hearts. And I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. In 1989, um, a sequel came out that some of you may remember, Back to the Future 2. Did you all ever watch that movie back in the day? If you remember, they went back to the future originally. They went to the past and back to the future. And in the Back to the Future 2, they went forward all the way to 2015. I know, it seems like a long time ago now. And some of the predictions that were made in that movie were spot on. Um, from Doc getting out of his car and saying the weather is going to change right now. Now we have watches that tell us when the weather is going to change. Some of us, right? We have face-to-face -face video communications where you can communicate with somebody around the world on a screen. That's insane, and they knew in 89 that was going to happen. A pre-version of social media came up in the movie, as well as a couple other things that were simply amazing. But then, they also drastically missed the mark. How many of y'all came to church this morning in your hover cars? <laughs> or rode a hoverboard that actually floated off, and just other things were a complete miss. Well, this month, the futurist who helped write the movie that was predicting the future, what it would look like, came up with some bold new predictions for what the world would look like in 2050. And what he is predicting is that by 2050, there could be nanobots so small they can live inside your brain and give you the capacity to be a 500 times smarter than you currently are. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get to be a bold futurist by making wimpy predictions. And I don't know about y'all, but that just seems a little absurd to me to think that little microcomputers could live in my brain in 25 years. That's astounding and terrifying. But we live in this world, in this middle, where we know what's possible, and some things that we thought weren't possible are possible, but yet we're still not where we think we could be yet in the future. I mean, who wouldn't love to live on the clouds like the Jetsons flying our cars or like the Flintstones pedaling your cars to work this morning from those 50s cartoons? We live in the middle or in the world that's yet but not yet fully realized. I think this is exactly the world that Jesus is talking about when he says, my kingdom is come and my kingdom is near. He's saying you're starting to get glimpses of what the kingdom of God looks like. We know that it has amazing things in store for us, but it's not quite fully there yet. 
In fact, this kingdom that, Matthew, or that Murray read about this morning from Matthew, um, in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus mentions the kingdom of God over a hundred different times. Matthew, he phrases it slightly differently on occasion. He uses kingdom of heaven. Most scholars think they're the two same thing interchanged. And in the gospel of Matthew, over 36 different times, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. You think if Jesus talks about something so frequently, we would be prudent to listen to his words. In fact, more than any other topic, even finances, Jesus talks about the kingdom. So anytime you hear a pastor say, Jesus talked about money more than anything else, no, he didn't. Go research it. He re talked about the kingdom more. And the way that Jesus brought the kingdom about, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, is the very first thing when Jesus enters the scene is he walks up and he says, repent for the kingdom of god is here and we look at how that word repent a lot of times in our modern world looks at changing your ways but what jesus was talking about is we had to start getting god out of the box sometimes we isolate and we make god too small too narrow too limited in focus and then the way that jesus demonstrated the kingdom's power is by the way and the life that he lived so last week we looked at how Jesus um, healed almost all he came into contact with, and we looked specifically at the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and raising the little girl that had been dead for, um, that was 12 years old and made her alive. And one of my favorite theologians, that's a German, Jürgen Moltmann, he says this, the healing of the sick is Jesus' most important testimony to the dawning of the kingdom of God. You see, when Jesus showed up on the scene about 2,000 years ago, he said, there is a new kingdom and there is a new king in town. Basically, it's like he's walking into town saying, hey guys, there's a new sheriff. There's a new boss, and let me tell you how it's going to be. And this was an absurd statement for a poor Jewish carpenter to make. Right? He lived under the system of the Roman Empire. I mean, it has, I mean no offense to our American Empire, but the Roman Empire had far more might and power than we do today reaching all across the Middle East. And here's a poor Jewish man saying, I'm going to be the king of this. And the Romans, nope, not so much. And he also was just a poor, poor man in the midst of a religious elite world where people were theologically trained, right? I mean, you're talking about the reverend doctors of the day knowing their who's who and what's what of biblical teaching. And Jesus says, here's God among you. Yet they thought they were in charge, but when God saw, when they saw God, they didn't even recognize him. Jesus is saying, look, the Romans aren't in charge, the Jews aren't in charge, God is. And the same message is true for us today, church. The world would have us believe that the Democrats are in charge, or the Republicans are in charge. But you know who in charge is, right? It's God. People would have you think that specific denominations are in charge, right? And I pray for the future of our denomination, which I'm excited about. But let me tell you, Jesus doesn't really care if you're a Methodist or a Baptist or a non-denom or a Catholic. He longs that you're following after him. It's not a denomination that's in charge. It's Jesus that's in charge. And what he's saying is that the new king is here and the kingdom has come and it's among you. But it makes me wonder, what does that mean for us today? If we're people that are supposed to be living under a new king in a new kingdom, well, it's 2,000 years old now. So what does that mean for us practically today? And that's where I love um, this text that Murray read from Matthew chapter 10. Um, Jesus gathers those that are close to him, his 12 disciples, and just listen to what he does again. These 12 disciples Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Don't go among the Gentiles or enter into any of the towns of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, I want you to proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. You hear it? Jesus is saying the kingdom is near. Right now, it's in your very presence. And then he asks them to do something for him. He says, I want you to heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. How would y'all feel if I said, okay, church, your marching orders for today is I want you to leave this place and go to K-Bob's. <laughs> How many people are planning on going to K-Bob's later today, right? 
Go to the hospital, pray over those in the ER, and watch them be healed. Find those with skin diseases and watch God miraculously heal them. Go to the funeral home next door and pray over those dead bodies and watch them come alive. And then the freakiest one to me is drive out demons. I mean, we're Methodists. We don't do that, do we? I don't know. It's here. And he says, freely you have received, freely give. How many of us here have freely received the unmerited grace of Jesus Christ in our lives today? Right? He says, I have given you something so good, so worthy. What I want you to do is I want you to turn around and go into this world and give that grace to me. And then he um, continues on, and I'm not going to preach through the whole book of Matthew chapter 10. I do encourage you to go read it this week. If you're wondering, what should I read in the Bible this week? Read Matthew 10. It has great instructions for his followers. He says, but hey, when you go, don't take any money with you because people are going to provide for you. They're going to open up their houses. And if they don't, just dust the feet off your sandals and walk away. But you're going to be like sheep among wolves. People are going to take advantage of you. So you have to be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. So watch out because your brother's going to betray you. Your sister's going to betray you. It's going to turn families against each other because of you're living under my kingdom now. And you're not above my teacher, uh, me, the teacher. You are one with me. And don't be afraid of this world. The world is going to try to kill you. But you should be afraid of God who's with you all the time. And whoever acknowledged me before others, I'm going to acknowledge them before the Father in heaven. So whisper what I'm telling you and shout it from the street tops. And anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And if you give a little cup of water to a small child, you are my disciple. That person will certainly not lose their reward. Jesus has these marching instructions for the twelve for them to go into the world and show them that a new king is in town. And the way they do it is they live a life that is radically different than the world around them, showing them that something has changed. And I kind of wish that Matthew would follow up on this. right? I mean, Matthew, in chapter 11, he immediately falls off, and the Jesus is going somewhere else, and they start talking about John the Baptist, and Matthew just says, go get out of here, 12 disciples, and Matthew doesn't tell us what the rest of the story is. I'm a modern American. I love to know the rest of the story. Right? I mean, I have a phone that will always tell me the rest of the story. I think we look at the Gospel of Luke, and we can find the rest of the story. Matthew didn't think it was important, but Luke, um, he tells the story just slightly differently. Instead of having the 12, Jesus has the 72. Um, Jesus liked to work in what I call circles. He had his inner three, Peter, James, and John, that he'd whisper things to and pull them aside and just invest knowledge to them. Then he had his 12 that he specifically called. Then there were the 72 that were faithfully all around him. There were a couple hundred people that were always around him um, outside of the 72. Then there were about a thousand people that come listen to him preach when he gave out free Big Macs. <laughs> Wait, they were Mac fishes, right? They weren't Big Macs. I try, Priscilla. Thanks for laughing. <laughs> and so there are these 72 in Luke chapter 10 that Jesus sends out, and he gives them very similar instructions. In fact, that's one of the things I just really, really love about God's word. It's in Matthew chapter 10, he sends out the 12. It's in Luke chapter 10, he sends out the 72. It's in verse, that, verse 8 that I quoted from before. Listen to verses 8 and 9 of Luke. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick, go there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Jesus gives the exact same words to the 72 in Luke as he does in Matthew. Your job is to leave this place and bring my healing to people that desperately need it. This is a pretty big task. We do have a few people that used to be in the medical field here, right? Yeah, I know who you are. But how many of you have ever gone and just deliberately tried to heal something. That's insane. And then what happens is in Luke 10, the disciples come back and listen to verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, and they said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. I don't know how 
close you feel to Jesus. But when I read this text, and I think even the demons submitted to us in your name, I can't tell you the last time I was walking through Midtown and demons started coming out of people. Well, I can tell you the last time because it hasn't happened. The disciples, they come back to Jesus, they give their report, and they're like, listen, not only were people healed, not only were people raised from the dead, but even the demons had something to say about us, and they fleed from our presence. And we know that the disciples didn't bat a thousand. Right? We know that every person they tried to heal didn't instantly get healed, because if you go look at Mark chapter 9, there's a boy that has epilepsy that's thrown into fire, and it takes Jesus coming back down the mountain to heal him, because his disciples were like, we can't handle this one. But man, Jesus and his disciples did some pretty crazy things. They were sent out by God, they healed people, and they drove out demons. If we want to be like Jesus in his early church, I wonder how many times we focused on what it means to not just be sent, but to heal and to cast out the evil spirits around us. I know, I'm getting a little charismatic for us today, aren't I? If we're at Sarah, I can smack her in the head again and watch her be healed. Even the demons listened to the disciples of Jesus. What about us? What does that look like for 21st century modern North American Christians? We're called to build the kingdom. But we also have to acknowledge that we live in this radical middle of the yet and the not yet. Yes, I mean, you are called. If you are sitting here and you have freely received the divine grace of Jesus Christ's love and forgiveness, he is calling you to do something for his ministry to do something to build his kingdom. And you may be thinking, well, Dustin, you're the one that's called. Well, I'm called to something specific. God is calling you as well. And part of that calling for some of us means being killed. But in this radical middle, what happens is we see things as we long for them to be, like who doesn't want a hover car? I think that'd be amazing. But we're not quite there yet. And so I'll never forget um, a time 13 years ago when I was preaching in shallow water, Texas at the time, and the orthopedic surgeon had told me my ACL was split, and I was going to have to um, be in bed for about four days, going through rehab. I was going to be on crutches for three to four months, and I went, the doctor went into my knee. I didn't do surgery on myself. That would have been insane. Um, and he got there, and he didn't find anything wrong. That's what some people said. They were so excited. And they were like, we prayed that God would heal you, and God healed you, and now it's better. And 13 years later, I can tell you, I still have some knee problems. And so how come God can hear your prayer some of the time, but now today when I have some knee pain, it's just not like, okay, Jesus, come and do your thing. <laughs> right? Do y'all ever feel like that? Just me? And how come sometimes um, you can... One of the great stories I heard about the fire is there was this man out protecting his house as flames were encroaching, and he was spraying water on his grass as fire was coming, and he was keeping the fire from his house, and he saw his neighbor's porch catch on fire, and he said, God, I'm doing everything I can to save this house, but I can't save my neighbors. You've got to do it. And he said, right after he uttered that prayer of a gust of wind came and blew out the fire that was on that deck. That's crazy. But what do I tell the 987 other people that lost their homes in the fire? Well, God loves this man more than he loves you. I, I think typically um, the modern response of the church is, well, the issue, Dustin, is the reason you still have knee pain is you just don't have enough faith. Right? And we use that as a value of our worth in God's kingdom. And well, if you just believed a little bit more, then God would do the supernatural, the miraculous in your lives. Not only is that bad theology, that puts the focus on the wrong person. Because when a healing comes to my faith, that makes it about me. And when we're talking about the healing and supernatural ministries of Jesus, it should really be about him. 
He is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he never changes. And the reality is, um, he tells us if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Right? I remember Jesus saying that one. You still with me? But sometimes, he likes mountains to stay where they're at. In his book, Steve Siemens, um, that I'm preaching through right now, The Wounded, or Follow the Healer, he says, understanding faith simply as the readiness to go to Jesus for help puts the focus where it rightly belongs, on the person of Jesus. That's where our focus needs to be, on him, not on us. Over and over again in the modern congregation, in the modern churches, we're looking to see the church as Jesus saw and to do the things that Jesus did. Our focus solely needs to be on Jesus. It's not on how good of a word that's proclaimed this morning or how bad. It's not on how much or how little faith you have. Sometimes it's not even on how desperate you are, like I talked about last week. But it's solely setting our eyes on Jesus and having him as our primary focus in our lives. Jesus sends out the 12, he sends out the 72, and God is calling each and every one of us to be sent out. To leave this place and to live lives like there is a new king and a new kingdom that has come. And God has gifted and graced every single person here that has freely received the spirit to do great things for his kingdom. Now, I'll tell you, I don't think God has called every single one of you to be healers. Some of you, he's given the grace to, be a hosp um, to open up your homes, to be hospitable. Some of you, he's given the grace to be teachers. Some of you, he's given the grace to deal with crazy pastors like myself. Some of you have just given the grace for, to continue to seek God through a deep life of prayer. And one of my reminders as a pastor, um, when I talk with some people, is, Dustin, I just wish I could die. God has no plan left for me. Let me tell you, as long as you're still breathing, as long as you're still upright, God longs to use you for his kingdom. And as I told my Sunday school class this morning, if you can't do anything else, at least you can pray. And if you don't think prayer is important, man, I think prayer changes things. And so, church, God is calling you. God longs for us as we follow the healer to be sent out into this world. God calls you to leave this place to, what does it say on the back of the door? Do y'all remember? Yeah, go make disciples to be his hands and feet, to bring about the kingdom. Um, he tells us what the end is. Um, and you know what? The ending of Revelation 21 is so much better than the ending of Back to the Future 2. It gets really confusing. Anytime they do time travel, I'm just like, that's dumb and it shouldn't work out. But listen to how the real end is. I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. For there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's better than a hover car. That's better than a future where nanobots live in your brain and dictate the internet to you. It's a future where God is dwelling in our midst as our God and we are his faithful people. This is the yet that we look forward to. But as we still live in the not yet of the reality of the fullness of the kingdom, we have to have faith. We have to trust that God is in all things. And church, we have to live lives that are sent. Jesus didn't just send the 12 and didn't just send the 72. The very last words he says in Matthew to his disciples, it says, go, therefore, and make disciples. That's why it's on the back of our door. We are his people in his world because there is a new king. There's a new sheriff. There's a better power than Republicans and Democrats. There's something more powerful than Santa Fe or Washington, D.C. And it is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Some of you, 
It does mean healing. Some of you, it does mean that you should go out and wrestle with the spiritual forces of the world. But some of you, it just means open up your doors, talking to a neighbor, saying a prayer for a person in need. And what does it say at the end of Matthew? Giving a cup of water to somebody that's thirsty. We can all be people that live lives sent in the kingdom. So church, let's be kingdom people doing kingdom things, trusting that Jesus is our way, our truth, and our life. And in his name, even the demons tremble. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that not only did you send the 12 and not only did you send the 72, but you send each and every one of us. And you call us to help build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. I thank you um, that we have freely received. And I pray that if there's anybody here that hasn't freely received the divine grace and forgiveness and life and love and joy of Jesus Christ, that you would just break that heart and you would allow them to come to accept and trust in you. But for those of us that have received, I pray that we just echo the words of Jesus as freely as we have received. Let us freely give. Let us go into the nations, bringing about your healing, bringing about deliverance, and bringing about your kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.